Greetings, friends, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to another edition <coughs> of the reading of The Grand Design Exposed by John Daniel, and we are continuing in Chapter 1, which is titled Manufactured Crisis, A Plot for World Change, and we are in Section 3, which is entitled Christ, Our Only Hope. So, in the previous two sections, we based, uh, Mr. Daniel here basically gave us an overview of, of what is perceived in the open view. And for those that can see that something is wrong here, we went over the as uh, he went over the aspect of people crying wolf too many times to the point um, where certain things are going to happen and people are going to call these things out but it's going to be too late because they cried wolf too many times and you know they're already um, locked in to the system and how things work within that system and near the end of the second section we started to get glimpses of um, of the aspect that you have these front organizations you have these front groups that are being manipulated and controlled by something or some force or forces that stay in the shadows and controls things behind the scenes and actually there is a neat little scripture in Daniel 11 um, when it talks about uh, the king of the north and the king of the south I forgot which verse it was exactly but uh, when you read through that chapter you'll see a very unique passage in there and it states that both of these kings hearts are to do mischief and that they speak lies at one table okay so obviously they speak lies at one table well who is actually speaking at the head of that table that both these kings are actually one and the same but out in the open they are front organizations and they act like they are against each other but behind the scenes they are really working hand in hand to create something in order to bring about a grand design okay and in this case it's what has been termed new world order which again as um, mr. Daniel also stated um, in the previous section that this new world order is really nothing new but it's something old that is repackaged reformatted and brought to the forefront and they call it a new world order so we're gonna um, read the next section which is to, which is entitled Christ our only hope and we have one more section to read in chapter one and we will be done with chapter one and uh, then we're gonna be getting into some very unique history so I'm gonna <clears throat> read the previous paragraph preceding section three there are other secret and semi-secret organizations such as the International Bankers, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderberg Group, Club of Rome, Trilateral Commission, the New Age Movement, the Illuminati, and Freemasonry, who are all deeply involved in global politics and who actively promote the uniting of the people of our planet under a new world order. However, and understand this well because it is extremely important, these all are but mere quote-unquote front organizations okay, behind which the true source of power hides and uses to distribute and channel its designs. And as I stated also, you can also include Jewry, Zionism, you know, in the midst of all these groups they are just front organizations okay Rothschilds you know the banking cartel they're front organizations okay that's what they are 
They might be very strong front organizations, but they are front organizations. And as in any conspiracy, secrecy and shifting attention and blame away from itself is paramount to its success. But this quote-unquote conspiracy is above all conspiracies and makes all others pale in significance. No stakes could be higher, no prize could be greater. To rule the entire world and to control every human being in it begins to touch upon a realm that is beyond the scope of man's grasp for whether man wants to acknowledge it or not, there is a sovereign God who is watching and promises to intervene. So throughout all this, God is allowing these things to happen because prophecy will be fulfilled. And so, and he has fulfilled prophecies in the past. He was in control in the past. He will be in control in the future. And he is in control in the present. So now we continue to section 3, which is called Christ, Our Only Hope. It is therefore with a very solemn dedication that the words of this book is sent on its mission, without prejudice or offense toward any persons, but only in love, to uncover, reveal, and share the truth about the system, quote-unquote, and other organizations who have confederated themselves together for the oppression of their brothers and sisters, citizens less powerful than they are. But in order to escape the risks of deception and being sidetracked into believing a falsehood through the most powerful and convincing source of influence conveyed by the media which this, quote-unquote, conspiracy has at its disposal, we raise up that book, given to mankind for our guide and final word for truth. The holy scriptures of the sovereign and almighty God, being forewarned, you are then admonished to draw near to our Savior Jesus Christ, for only through him is our victory over this conspiracy possible. I'll just stop right there and I'll just add a little something to that. The reason being, it is only through Christ, is because... This system actually uses Christ to cloak itself so cleverly, so subtly, that if you are not grounded in the true Jesus Christ, then you will be led astray. For a world that is racked with insurmountable problems, there is great personal solace and comfort to know, and with complete confidence that there is a loving God that not only cares, but intends to intervene and make things right. But the heartbreaking side of the story is that our sophisticated society today is completely oblivious of this God, including those remarkable unbroken promises that he has given in his word. The scriptures. Amazing promises, when known, that becomes such a soothing balm when facing our world's ills, and by a God that proves he does not lie and we, can, and we can trust by giving us his elaborate promises centuries beforehand and then are precisely kept. Only the true and loving God of creation has that ability to do this. It is revealed in scripture that man from the very beginning is bent on rejecting God's love and authority and prefers his own systems of rulership and worship. And it, and it has brought untold misery, death, and problems upon the earth. It is a struggle that is as old as man himself. And God in scripture has promised that this struggle for world domination and world kingdoms with its false religion would continue until he intervenes in man's affairs and sets up his own kingdom of love and righteousness. It is for this purpose that the pages that you are about to embark on wants to make known that the God who actually created and shows his love for us certainly is not responsible for man's woes, but it is man himself and his rebellion against God that have brought on these woes and with staggering consequences. Yet, in spite of man's obst obstinacy, God in his love, so that mankind will not be fearfully groping in the dark, has revealed specifically in scripture 
those rebellious world empires that would arise to usurp and show contempt for God's authority and support a world false religion. It is the purpose of this book to boldly pull back the veil of misinformation and deception of these world systems and that collaborating false religion that the reader may see and understand today's current events and prove in his own mind what is truth. To begin, anyone that has studied world history, even casually, knows that the last four world empires that rose and fell in succession until our very own day were Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. This is secular history, okay? You don't even need the Bible to figure this one out. You know the Bible confirms what secular history has taught us in regards to these four world empires. <clears throat> and when the prophecies of Daniel were written, when this uh, prophecy regarding these, the the dream of Nebuchadnezzar with the with the statue and the four beasts, okay, I give you a hint on something. This was only during the first world empire, which was Babylon. So, so that just goes to show how old this prophecy is. And later on down the line, secular history confirms it. <clears throat> so again, to begin, anyone that has studied world history even casually knows that the last four world empires that rose and fell in succession until our very own day were Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And it is Rome, the last of these world empires, that today the whole Western civilization looks to for its roots. But God revealed to the prophet Daniel in chapters 2 and 7 of his book that these four world empires would emerge centuries before they appeared, even describing some of their basic characteristics. God, in Daniel chapter 7, used symbols of animals to represent these political world powers. But Rome... The last world power is described in scripture to be diverse or different from all the others. In fact, it was so different and so terrible that even though God used beastly animals of nature to represent the first three empires, take note, okay, there was no animal in nature to even compare it with the fourth. Daniel called it the fourth beast. The prophet John in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, 1 through 10, was shown this same power and also called it the beast. It is a political and religious world power. It received worship. It is Rome. It is wrong to be kidding and deceiving ourselves. The beast described in scripture is not some oversized computer sitting in Brussels, Belgium, as some suggest. It sits on seven hills in Italy. The history of Rome, even though it has been greatly suppressed, is filled with shocking horror stories. Its methods of execution and torture go far beyond our human imaginations. These were not isolated cases, but instead cruelty and brutality were the socially accepted norm among the ruling class and became the amusement and recreation of the general populace. In other words, it became entertainment. The early Christians had read in Scripture, Daniel 7, 7, 11, and 12. If you want to go ahead and pause me and read these, you can. The fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And so they knew what was in store for them under Rome's rule. They also knew from Scripture that Rome was to undergo certain phases or physical changes in her long reign, but was to continue to exist right up until God set up his own kingdom, destroying Rome in the burning flame at her Lord's second coming. The people of God, whether Jewish, early Christians, or true Christians today, know exactly what to expect from Rome, the beast. 
God promised and foretold in Scripture that Rome was to undergo three separate phases. The first is what we know as historically pagan Rome, as a world empire. Rome was to collapse and then divide into small national fragments, but in an attempt to bind these national fragments together for over a thousand years, the supreme pontiff or pontifex maximus of the Babylonian mystery religion began a reign of terror in Europe unparalleled in human history. This was Rome's second phase, when Europe was ruled by the Roman Universal Church and is known historically as Papal Rome. But Papal Rome was to lose its power too, and did. Seeking to regain that lost power, the world today is racing pell-mell toward Rome's third and last stage of determined world domination. You ever hear the phrase in Revelation where it talks about the beast that was and is not, and yet is. Talk about these three stages of this beast. It must be clearly understood that the Church of Rome, even though she is not openly dominating the world just yet, is by far the most powerful, wealthiest, and influential organization upon the face of the earth. During Rome's second phase, called Papal Rome, the Roman Catholic Church of those medieval times held the population of the Western world in an iron grip of tyranny from which there was no escape. Her method of compelling others to conform was by stark terror and torture. She set up her ecclesiastical tribunals called the Inquisition, and justified them by saying it was all in the name of God. Then she went about her inhuman, inhumane acts of torture, to purge the world of what she considered nonconformists and branded them as heretics. In today's word, you could call heretics terrorists. It is so very hard today to imagine how anyone could watch and inflict systematic tortures designed to bring to its victims the most severest and agonizing pain to the very point of death, yet denying death and then start the process all over again. Even on an animal, much less another human being, how can we today grasp the living conditions of the common, su of the common serf and serf and peasant under the feudal system where kings and the higher clergymen lived in pomp, luxuries, and extravagances of every kind, while the peasant and lower parish priests, who associated and sympathized with them, scratched out their grim existence without hope of redress or relief from their oppressions except only by death. Rome, even today, does not deny this barbaric time of her history. She just does not want to advertise it and prefers to keep it quiet till she can employ it once again. These atrocities are so repugnant to the character of the true God, which is love, that no wonder the Church of Rome forbids God's word, the scriptures to be read. Rome hates to have her crimes exposed. She goes to great lengths to censor and establish elaborate cover-ups, and she can because of her powerful influence. But the God of love looks down upon his stricken people and buoys their sinking spirits by giving them hope and confidence in, in his word. That it will not always be this way. God exposes these world political systems and its Babylonian religion so that his people may see and compare with his own character, proving how far the depraved mind can go when it is controlled by Satan. The central theme running throughout all the scriptures from cover to cover is that one person, Jesus Christ, who, as a gift from God to humanity, adamantly declares that he will triumph over the oppressors and pick up the downtrodden. But for those who have never been told this wonderful good news, they must be led to God's word so that they may partake and be refreshed. They must understand God's promises. And because Rome has affected the whole world, we must have a basic knowledge of what Rome was like yesterday if we are to understand what Rome's ambitions are today. If we are to clearly understand biblical terms like the beast in his image and appreciate scriptural language that states she was quote unquote drunken <clears throat> excuse me with the blood of the saints we must know the ferociousness of Rome's past to see why the god of scripture would describe Rome as 
the beast. This book's purpose in unveiling Rome's dark past must bring to light certain specific areas of the Church of Rome's history that she has purposely and effectively covered up. It must emphasize strongly that the Church of Rome at one time was the most powerful and brutal political religious institution upon planet Earth. That it also lost that temporal power to crush and destroy those who do not agree with her. This book will show how that quote-unquote loss becomes directly connected and associated with movements and organizations. Okay, so this loss was a purposeful, purposefully done loss. Okay, so let me go ahead and read this again. It must emphasize strongly that the Church of Rome at one time was the most powerful and brutal political religious institution upon planet Earth. That it, meaning the Church of Rome, also lost that temporal power to crush and destroy those who did not agree with her. So in a sense, it was like a self-sacrifice. <clears throat> so this loss of temporal power was done deliberately this book will show how that loss becomes directly connected and associated with movements and organizations some that many people have never heard of such as the Knights Templar Protestantism the Inquisition Freemasonry the Jesuits the Illuminati and even how Rome was very much involved in the founding of the United States of America. But most important, it will show how in Rome's fanatical obsession to regain that loss, she has launched a grand design upon an unsuspecting world to bring it once again under her control. We must explore Rome's hidden obscured past so that the correct view of today's end time current events and their relationship with the beast and his image and the new world order can be known. So that's going to do it for section three of this reading and we will continue on with section four in the next video. And section four is going to be very short and then we will proceed on to chapter two and chapter two is going to basically is going to start with the historical lessons and stuff like that and we are going to be getting into a very interesting point in history uh, regarding the Knights Templar and chapter two is going to be called the Knights Templar paves way for Protestant Reformation um, it's a very unique title, um, but as you'll realize in this chapter, you're going to see why it paved the way for the Protestant Reformation. So, <clears throat> we're almost done with chapter one. we got one more section to go, and then we will be on to chapter two. Thank you for listening. Truth be told, truth be known, stay safe. God bless. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.